Hello, Nick. How are you? Hey, good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Welcome to the Creative Insider Podcast. Uh, I was telling you also that uh, I find out about you thanks to the D2 conference because you were one of the speakers uh, this year. And uh, it was yeah, really yeah. it was really funny when I googled your account, uh, smear balls, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's my professional uh, business name. <laughs> well, what exactly, yeah. like when somebody goes to your website, it's a very funny website because <laughs> you have to like, you're like walking in this game sort of. It looks like a little bit like if you have played Doom, it looks a little bit like early yeah. early, early days Doom. <laughs> so what exactly do you do? What is the yeah. business Mirabals? Well, it's kind of a mix of all kinds of things. It's uh, I do a lot of kind of animation stuff lately. Mostly it's been 3D animation, but for everything, for films, television, you know, VR applications, uh, advertising, music videos. So it kind of whatever comes into my inbox, <laughs> it, uh, it makes its way to all kinds of different applications. But um, yeah, for years I, I was kind of more focused on advertising and that kind of like broke into other fields like you know because of advertising i started doing some more 3d rendering some character based stuff and um you know it's kind of st i started out in 2d doing more like after effects video remixy kind of things and then that led into more 3d stuff using 3d you know titles and 3d animation to kind of soup up my 2d after effects renders and now it's kind of fully flipped where i'm almost all 3d and using houdini and uh, for simulation, Cinema 4D, Octane Render, um, you know, Character Creator, iClone, uh, Rococo Motion Capture. So it's kind of like I'm always learning new software and kind of using it in all these different applications. So one thing is that it's not so obvious to um, when you go on the website and to find like sort of a, an about page or something <laughs> similar as you would find in a... <laughs> Uh, traditional um, website, which I don't say it's. Uh, I mean, I I think it's fine. It's fine, and it's fun to have something original like yours. But what is the? Um, I always like to start from the origin. How did you? What is your background? What is your education? Are you educated as a designer, or did you do all by yourself? Did you learn? Are you self-taught? Three uh, D artist, animation, and yeah, so on? it's yeah, most mostly. Yeah, mostly self-taught. I. Uh... I went to art school back in like 1999, 2000. Like, so that was kind of a weird time when they were still like transitioning from, from, uh, you know, VHS and beta, like videotape editing to computers. And we were already kind of like, I was at the point where I already had it. One of my dad's old computers, I could barely do video and some animation, but they were still teaching, uh, VHS at school. So I had to take two or three years of VHS before I could go <laughs> onto the computers at school. So they were kind of behind the times at that time. So I actually dropped out of school. I was just kind of like, eh, I don't see like a career in this. Uh, so I, I left and I needed to make money and survive here in the city. So I started a, a, like a house painting company with later turned into a construction company. And that grew for about nine or 10 years where all of a sudden I was doing large scale construction projects like, you know, full home renovations and, and commercial structural remediation and these huge warehouse buildings and all kinds of things like that. So I was, I was, had a career in construction working with architects and engineers. And then I was always just dicking around and making my funny videos and stuff on the side for fun. So I never really set out to do a career in video stuff. I was just doing it for fun on the side. And when YouTube came around, you know, I started posting all my remixes. I was taking old infomercials and funny commercials that I would I would take off the airwaves and record on my computer. And then I would start messing with them and make musical remixes and stuff on YouTube. So that started catching on and getting some views. And then I started getting advertising jobs from that. So it was sort of an unintended career move where that stuff took over and then I kind of dissolved my construction company and just did animation and video full-time. That sounds like a lot of the stories uh, we hear around that uh, most of the times these uh, passions that turn into a business in an unexpected way um, but it's mm -hmm. so you had your own construction company you were not working as a construction mm -hmm. worker 
Uh, that's yeah, weird. yeah. So, I mean, I was doing the construction work as well. It was just course, sort of a, just me and some friends at first. And then it was just, you know, I had a few employees, but mostly it was like uh, hiring subcontractors and yeah, running my own jobs. And um, did uh, what were the first, uh, what was the content of the first um, videos that you were doing on for YouTube? Uh, what were you for YouTube? Yeah, like I said, it was kind of like silly remix stuff where I, my friends and I would green screen ourselves into commercials and like punch somebody in the face or I would like swap out somebody's body or like I would take uh, evangelists like Christian televangelists and like, you know, put doom demons behind them and, just, you know, <laughs> really crude, you know, and I put party hats on people like really crude. I wasn't very good at the time. You know, I was very just learning after effects. So it was kind of like very crude animation but fun funny ideas you know kind of started out with that <laughs> so you started with uh basically the after effects and the premiere pro stuff like that yeah yeah and it just kind of like i think because i always just did that silly stuff for fun people started hiring me to do that because it's kind of like in in the world in general people don't or people hire hire you to do what you've already done you know, like people don't just like find you and be like, let's ask this guy to do something completely outside of his, you know, exactly. uh, wheelhouse. So I just kind of feel like just because I did all this silly, ridiculous stuff over the years, people started hiring me to do silly, ridiculous stuff. And that kind of led to a career in this, uh, you know, where you can make it with a name like Smearballs. <laughs> <laughs> but what were these uh, first projects like? Uh, what was like... Uh... I mean, uh, I, I don't think that somebody called you and say, hey, Nick, can you make me like an uh, evangelist with some demons on the background? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Those video are, those... For my commercial. <laughs> yeah, those are all for fun. But actually, my first big uh, project was for Ken Block, who is like the uh, oh yeah, he's a crazy ra race car driver, and he's a founder of DC Shoes. So he had seen one of my or a few of my remixes on on YouTube, and he was like, "Hey man, like just on the down low, can you remix my Jim Connor videos? And those are like stunt driving videos where he's driving sideways through warehouses and just doing all the crazy drifting and like really cool cool driving videos that he made." So he asked me to kind of sort of pretend like I just did it on my own accord, and he was going to pay me, you know, just to like under the table to be like, "Hey, just make it so that you just did this for fun." So I'm like, yeah, cool, man. This is like, you know, my first kind of video job. So it's like we went crazy with it. My buddy Davey and I teamed up and we we added pterodactyls attacking his car and just all like just all kinds of crazy stuff. And when we showed it to him and he was like, this is awesome. I want to make it an official DC spot. And they put our names on it. And we did. We, he shot a whole bunch of extra video footage for us to mess with. And like it turned into like a proper you know, DC shoes job. And he sent me like 20 pairs of shoes and all kinds of cool stuff. So it was kind of my first gig in advertising and hurled me into that world. So it was kind of cool that it came from YouTube and was just, you know, wasn't even supposed to be a job at first. <laughs> what what year is that? Was that when DC, DC shoes was still like kind of new? Uh, yeah, that was probably he, 2000, I think... 2009, I think, somewhere around oh. there. So you were like really, really in the early days of YouTube because I think YouTube started 2006 or something like that. And mm -hmm. in the beginning, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember I, because I'm a little younger probably than you are. Um, I'm 30, and I mm -hmm. remember in 2006 um, I learned about YouTube from a friend of my dad, and he told me, "Yeah, there is this new website. It's kind of cool." And um, I don't know. I was uh, using it to watch like. Uh, soccer highlights you know like because here it's very popular so i was a yeah. kid very much into soccer and this was the first so i, I kind of i wasn't conscious enough to or at least i didn't have the abilities at all to to post something on youtube in the early days uh, also because yeah. internet connection was like uh sure yeah even the, the quality restrictions back then were pretty harsh but, and is is this video still available online? The one that you uh, yeah, did? if you look up uh, Jim Kana 2.0 remix, it's on. Uh, it should be online still, I think. Yeah. Okay, I'll try to to look yeah. for it and put the the link in the description of this one video, <laughs> so that people can go check it out. Or maybe maybe record a little piece and put it on top of the conversation, so that people can get yeah, uh, sure. get a hint. 
Um, and that was in uh, from there on uh, was um, came Block happy with your work and did you get some then refer reference to to further gigs or just naturally? Yeah, more sure. More I did. I did some stuff for Red Bull after that, like kind of remixing their uh, some of their sports videos. I did. Um, I got another job that was kind of cool. Um, because I did another remix of the, there's a TV show called The View in America with all like these ladies that just talk about politics and events and stuff like that. And uh, I did a remix of, of them talking about a sex tape. So they're all saying sex tape, sex tape. And I made a song out of it. <laughs> and I just kind of did that video for fun in 2010. And it was, it just kind of made it onto all these different TV shows, started picking it up and these different um platforms everywhere so that kind of led to me getting a job with mondo media which is a big animation company in the states they did a cartoon called happy tree friends and they got a round of like youtube funding that was like back i think around 2010 youtube kind of put a whole bunch of money at different companies so that they could create kind of premium content just so that they were trying to you know keep the quality up on their site in general and in the early days, so that uh, I pitched the Mondo because Mondo got some of this funding. I pitched them a, like kind of a news remix uh, show called News Hit or or New Shit, whatever you know, a news hit spelled all one word. And uh, so every week during the like Obama Mitt Romney election, I did like a new video every week from the news highlights of that week, and I'd make a song and add animation and After Effects, and that was kind of my web series. So I did that for I think whatever 10 or 12 weeks in a row or something like that and that um, kind of made the rounds and some of the people at Conan O'Brien the, the late night show host in America yeah um, uh, team Coco they're the, the website that was doing all of his uh, online stuff they saw my my videos and asked me if I wanted to pitch stuff for team Coco so I started making like little uh, you know, political satire videos and stuff like that and pitching it to them and my boss over at team coco would take his computer bring it over to conan's desk and if conan liked it it would like make it on the air that night so all of a sudden i had this kind of crazy back door onto late night television from my studio here in toronto i didn't even work there i was just like making videos on my little green screen and sending them in and they would make it on tv so it was kind of a, i did that for many years like that was three or four years of just doing that every day, like pumping out as many videos as I could every week, sending them in and crossing my fingers and hopefully they made it on the air, you know? So that was kind of a cool uh, career shift after that initial advertising. So, um, how did it work? You were a one man show and then you pitched these videos and if they liked the videos, they would pay you per video or did you have some At first, sort of agreement? Yeah, for, for, the, for the first little while it was per video. And then after I kind of, you know, they started to like my stuff. They and then they offered me kind of a salary uh, uh, retainer for the year. So I then every year I would renew my contract with them. Okay, it was so, like. Uh, but did you have some? Uh, what is it called? Um, did you need to commit to make to, to make some certain amount of videos, or was it? Yeah, like I kind of I somewhat had a quota. I think I forget how it exactly worked, but I, every week I made sure that I pitched at least three videos. You know what I mean? So, but also by then I I had a bunch of recurring bits that I did. Like I used to take two celebrities and and kind of do a deep fake before their deep fakes. Like I would take. I would scour YouTube and try and find two celebrity interviews where they had similar lighting and they were, you know, similar face motions. And then I would take one face and put it on another and do in After Effects, do all the warping and like, you know, stabilizing to swap these faces. And now, of course, Deepfake came around and made that easy as hell to do. But it was it was pre Deepfake. So that was kind of a regular bit that I did all the time that they could kind of count on it that I would do that every week. So I, I had these staple things that uh, kept the kept the flow going but um so at what at, at, after how long after how long of these like random gigs that you received and the youtube uh stuff um was it wasn't worth it anymore to do the construction uh business anymore or you still do also construction on the That's, side no i don't do that stuff anymore although i wish i did because i'd probably be in better shape than i am now from sitting at the computer all the time 
but no, I was probably, it wasn't just cut and dry. Like all of a sudden, I, you know, I'm not doing construction anymore. There was a bunch of years where I was like, okay, I didn't get any video jobs for a few months. I better make some money, you know? So it was kind of back and forth where I'd still pick up a job or I'd build a cottage up north or something like that. And so I can't really say, I think maybe my last construction job was 2011. It might've been a two year period of doing both sort of, you know? <laughs> So it wasn't like right away big money for these videos. It was more like side hustle. No. Yeah, exactly. Just it, it kind of like running two side hustles instead of one full-time job. <laughs> and uh, was it just your, uh, you said you started with your father's computer and then uh, did art school anyhow also influence you on like um, having this passion for this creative? Oh yeah, for or... sure. I mean, there was always like at art school, like there was people doing some really cool video art stuff there. And, but it was more just kind of like, I guess it was also like kind of a financial decision of like, I need to go make some money. Like, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know, but I, I, my art school was kind of interesting because they were, a, it was a very small school, thousand students or something like that. When I first went at, at Ontario college of art and design here in Toronto, and uh, they had planned to do this giant renovation. So at that time they took the school and they like, they turned all these spaces that were supposed to be, you know, performance spaces and galleries and they turned them into classrooms. So then the students had nowhere to show work and there was nothing, you know, cool going on. So a bunch of students at my school kind of protested. And I remember there being these big noise, you know, protests in the middle of the school and teachers were dumping garbage on the students and everything. And then they said, fuck it. And they ran for student council a bunch of these these kids and they took over student council all of a sudden had a budget of you know hundreds of thousands of dollars and they rented this space downtown that was this cool kind of art gallery called art system and they we turned that into a crazy booze can where there was awesome parties every weekend and huge art shows where we bring in actually big established artists and have shows so that was kind of going on at the same time as school so i quit art school but i kept a foot in that door and kept hanging out with like you know the people and and uh kept my my uh, self in the actual art scene which was really cool and you didn't really have to pay for art school to go be a part of that you know what i mean so it was <laughs> kind of a uh influence in my life regardless of you know going to the classes how was it it's seen by your uh former schoolmates were they like uh because um, I'm an architect myself, and um, when uh, when you're within an architectural community, they, like it's very snobby, I would say. Like, and <laughs> if you were not to, if you were not to like do, if you're not were not to be really part of it, they would be telling you like, uh, not telling you, but at, at least treating you like you're not really like. Uh, a part of it like you're a con artist you're not like a sure yeah, a yeah. Legit <laughs> person I, I'm, I'm sure that uh architecture is is a bit different than uh art, art school for for that kind of thing because it's a bit more of like you actually need your degree to get a job in that yeah. field you know whereas in art it's not so important mostly I, I don't think i've ever been asked for my diploma for any you know freelance yeah, work cares. every time <laughs> nobody cares and but, some of the architects like which end up doing uh, cg art or archivists you've seen probably many examples of the d2 um like if along the way in your architectural path you decide that you don't want to do actual buildings then mm -hmm. you should also drop and just learn the softwares and and go sure. go make money because it makes no sense well, I think that's still kind of the case in a lot of schools where they, you know, a lot of the time, if a teacher has not been in the field for 10 years, the it changes so quickly. The software changes from year to year so quickly. Like it's it's incredible how hard it is to keep up with everything, even being, you know, da the daily user of all this software, let alone a yeah, teacher. So I find that now all these online schools like school of motion and stuff like that. They, they're using people that are currently, you know, using all these tools and can teach you way better in a lot of ways. Like I'm not sure with motion graphics and VFX that a university is the best place to get your education at all, <laughs> you know? No, but, I think there are some academies that are more like they don't give you such an official degree, 
but they're more like intense compressed course in like within i don't know a couple of months max and then you'll learn like you work hands-on i've that's also a model and then there are also this all online uh all in all online classes and websites for example my approach is if i need to learn a new software i would go and go to a software like Udemy or now there's Domestic or Skillshare. Get one of those 10 yeah. bucks uh, classes that give you the solid base to understand how to move within the software. And then you can Google exactly what you need to do in that software. And I'm sure one person did a video because this is how I learned. Like, I don't know. It would yeah, be like, it's, that's... if it's the case of After Effects, I would Google like, I don't know, how to do a... Um, map with a line that connects to dots and then for sure one person did exactly that video yeah yeah especially after effects because that software hasn't changed at all in like 20 years hardly so it's like the tutorials are all still relevant for the most part yeah uh, this yeah is... no i think i just i think that it's the way to learn nowadays and there's so many people that have dedicated their lives to doing tutorials and like especially in like cinema 4d world and stuff like and you know it's it's amazing how many resources are out there and how many people kind of give the info away for free it's amazing have you done yourself some of those classes somewhere i made, or? I made one tutorial for as a joke like back in 2010 how to make uh testicles and a scrotum in cinema 4d with a uh, cloth simulation and picture of chicken legs <laughs> and actually for a little while it was the most popular cinema 4d tutorial in the world like in 2010 that was kind of early days of you know tutorials and that one went kind of viral i mean it had a hundred thousand views or something but for a cinema 4d tutorial it was pretty huge you know and i talked to somebody at max on years later like 10 years later and he was like oh yeah that made the rounds at the maxon offices when you made that <laughs> it was like amazing <laughs> yeah. the people who made the software actually checked out my video so so you 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 started with the the more like um after effects stuff and um what what softwares did you add along the way because you mentioned cinema 4d houdini i started like with during the uh that chem block video back in 2009 a friend of mine was kind of trying to teach me max so i started in max and i i struggled with it for like a year and i was like i found it really not very intuitive to tell you the truth i just kept like forgetting and like needed to relearn over and over again and then i don't know i tried cinema 4d and i just stuck it was just so much easier i found i found the U, ui to be very easy to pick up and i just kind of like stuck with that one i mean Nowadays, if I was starting out as a 3D artist, it's pretty expensive, Cinema 4D. I mean, I started back in the days where you could, you know, easily get cracked software and stuff like that. <laughs> so it's a lot. Uh, maybe it's still easy these days, but I haven't been in that world for a long time. But I don't know. I, I'm just looking at how quickly Blender is moving and like the, the tools are pretty amazing. I don't know. I, I'm kind of interested in, in Blender as well. I don't think I would switch over to it right now because I've, I'm like you know more than a decade deep in cinema 4d but it, i do use blender for certain things once in a while you know converting files and opening up things and their uv tools are really good like like you know i dabble in it a little bit but uh yeah i don't know cinema 4d has kind of been my main jam for so long and i have massive libraries of cinema 4d octane materials and objects and it's that alone is is a deterrent to go into any other software because everything's like one click into my scene this huge library of everything i've built over the last 10 years so you know you get stuck in a in a zone sort of once you've thrown that much time into a piece of software i'm i'm curious um like a lot of people are very interested into software tools me too like because i think it's um, interesting to understand what kind of uh, workflow and people have because in the end of the day, it's like a craft. So you need to, you need to know which tools to learn. And it's like, you know, it's like uh, really like doing with something with your hands, like getting a diff, picking up a different tool will help you in a different way and will develop a different style. Um, but totally. what, what um what is really the secret ingredient because i in the end of the day from talking to so many people in your industry or similar industries in the end of the day almost every everyone can learn the software pretty well 
but what is what really makes the difference is exactly these ideas and this um, storytelling, if you want. Um, do you have some because the ideas that you mentioned so far they're quite like interesting i would say quite like to to come up with the idea to make a tutorial about how to make uh scrotum <laughs> and in cinema 4d or all the all the videos that you did for conan um mm -hmm. do, do you like how how do you come up with ideas do you have some scripting process or you just play around and see how it works and then it comes together yeah, I just mostly play around. Like I, I hate planning things out. Like sometimes I'll be, you know, walking on the street and I come up with an idea out of nowhere and I'm like, oh yeah, I should do that, you know. But 99% of the time it's like, oh, I look at my library or I'll go, you know, get a model or create a character in some 3D software. I have some kind of starting point of something I know I want to do and then, you know, at, start building in the software. And then, because uh, I, I started out in the remix world where it's like, okay, I'm going to take this, guy from this televangelist and i'm gonna make a funny video out of it so i start taking his audio and i'll i'll go in premiere and start editing it and make make it make him cut up his words so he says something funny so i'm like oh that make that made me laugh just trial and error you know cut and paste rearranging his words and i'm like that's funny and then take that and that what he said is something that uh gave me a visual idea so then i'll go in after effects and put something on his head and blah 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 and then that's funny. And then to go back to the editing suite and see what other clip could follow that and be funny. And then, you know, it just kind of naturally builds. And then you get a visual idea and then you get a musical idea. And I jump around between all these softwares until the video's done. So it just kind of naturally happens, you know, making decisions as you're messing around in the software. So that's kind of how I attack the 3D stuff now, too, is like I've got these libraries of stuff and now I can jump into my mocap suit and act a, make puppet the character with my mocap suit. And that might give me another idea of who's going to be watching him. And maybe I'll put a couch next to them and have somebody sit on there doing something else. Like it just kind of starts flowing from as you build the scene, you know. So I, I usually nowadays start with an environment like a uh, recent one I did of a construction site because I kind of like wanted to do an animation going back to my construction world. So I kind of started building this, you know, plywood and unfinished construction site and adding the details, all the electrical panels and all the plumbing and stuff like that. And then just started to get ideas of what would be funny to have like a guy on a ladder with his pants falling down and, uh, you know, somebody dumping a wheelbarrow with somebody down the stairs. I don't know. It just the the ideas came from the environment. So I find nowadays I've, I've just built the environment and the ideas come from that, just from making a scene and what would be funny to put in that scene, you know? So it kind of naturally just happens. And then of course, because these, some of these pieces I've been making lately are so detailed, they take me a month. So you're thinking about that piece for a whole month. So all these ideas come because you just spend so much time on it. You know, you eventually have to make, you know, thousands of decisions. <laughs> <laughs> and, so. and, uh, and how was it in the early so how was it in the early days when you were working on construction like you were coming back in the evening and just playing around a little bit with it or did you have a group of friends that were also passionate about it so that you guys could share ideas and I don't know this sometimes you know when you're in the environment like they say you become with who you like like with the people with who you are and then this um it's very helpful if you're like in a uh, environment that it's made out of people that are passionate about oh, the yeah. same thing. Like, you know, well, like I, I kind of hung out with a lot of uh, musicians and stuff. So I was in bands and then uh, my, one of my old bands from just out of high school, we had, we bought an old school bus that was like full sized, you know, big, school bus and we t turned it into a recreational vehicle like painted it all black and put all these seats in it or uh, took out all the seats and put little bedrooms in it and we toured all around Canada in this old school bus so in the early YouTube days it was always um, you know jamming with my friends and making funny videos to promote our shows or making uh, you know even early MySpace days it would be like we need to get our, get people to this show so we made a funny video threw it on MySpace and spammed everyone's page to you know, get people to come out to our concerts. Or if we were touring into another town, we'd make a video of us in that town doing silly antics. We had like a really loud, you know, horn that had farm animal noises and crazy things on a loudspeaker so we could like roll up and down the town strip and, you know, promote our shows. So I, I kind of started out just making 
videos for my friends' bands and, and bands that I was managing and stuff like that. So that was kind of my, you know, group of peers that we were focusing our energy on, on making visuals was, was surrounded by, you know, music stuff. So, yeah. So, so construction was just the fuel for your real passion? Was yeah. Like well, that, that was like, because I was doing the band stuff while I was running the construction outfit. So I would go, you know, on the weekend, I would, you know, stop my construction job on Friday night and we would get into the school bus and go all weekend, who knows where in Ontario and then come back Sunday. And then I go back to work again on Monday. So it was literally like weekend warrior, you know, having mm -hmm. fun touring around and, and making videos like, you know, in the evenings when I got back from that stuff too. So I look oh, back okay. at that and I'm in my thirties. I'm like, how did I even have time for all that shit? You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it's uh but it's I, when you got that energy and you can do it, it's, uh, a lot of fun yeah 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 sure no it's cool that you managed to keep it like um like a passion and you never stopped and then somehow naturally and organically come together and um uh, and, and then you manage to turn it into something profitable and and how do you feel about um how did you feel about when you got your like first um uh, when it got more like legit, like you were constantly getting this interesting project, which I mean, being aired on one of the biggest late night shows, it's like a big mm -hmm. deal. So did you always manage to keep your like playful spirit and be like, oh, I'm just going to keep doing this for fun? And Yeah, uh, I mean, it was always kind of, especially with the late night stuff, they were always just my ideas and stuff that I could do, you know. Uh, whatever I wanted and I would pitch it and it would just you know they could take it or leave it kind of so it, that was super fun and easy to keep fun but it was also a pretty big trip to be like whoa I, like I just recorded some crap off the tv and then I made something out of it and I uploaded it and now it's on that same tv you know it was a real trip to like you see it my work on on that big public stage you know it was cool but um I think the most like kind of like disheartening jobs are the ones where you do something and it just gets changed over and over and over again for no good reason. Like advertising is pretty bad for that work. You do a project and there's like 20 people that tell you to change it for sometimes no reason. And it that can be pretty disheartening where it's like, you know, it's not fun anymore. <laughs> so sometimes those jobs I find more, you know, like, disheartening or make you not want to do it then then like you know something like not getting a cool job you know like if, if i have a job that's not very high profile but i can do whatever i want and it's still fun like it's you know that's more fun than doing a high profile gig that's a huge pain in the ass <laughs> so yeah it's kind of like there's both sides of the coin on both sides of the you know spectrum and um is it like nowadays, especially in these years, has uh, developed this like sort of cancel culture and um, there is a certain things that you shouldn't say or you shouldn't say even for fun. Um, has this sort of damage also your... Uh, like your your kind of style that you have in your because it's like your style seems to me like to be very politically unco incorrect to be like um, making fun of things that are also sometimes exaggerated or a little bit scurrile, let's co say that way. Um, yeah. Do you need to moderate yourself or self censor sometimes? Because it also like I don't know, platforms I like YouTube might also not cancel you but like strike you yeah i've had quite a few I, I mean i don't really feel like i need to censor myself i most of the stuff i'm doing is just absurd and ridiculous and there's not really i don't think a malicious intent or anything that's like you know rocking any boats like as far as like racial discrimination or uh, anything that I think is like cancelable, really. I'm not, re I don't really tread on those waters for the most part. I'm just making mostly just really stupid, ridiculous things. <laughs> but most of my uh, stuff that I got uh, 
deleted on like Instagram and TikTok and stuff like that is uh, was when I was making funny Trump videos. I had 3D models of Trump like crapping his pants or whatever. But his fans, I guess, just don't have a good sense of humor about stuff. And I would get, uh, you know, those videos would get flagged or deleted. And, and you know, then I started getting like a risk to my account that if I had too many strikes against it, my account could get deleted. So I'm like, oh, I guess I got to stop making these Trump videos, which is unfortunate because I've also I made videos of Obama and Joe Biden and all kinds of other uh, Hillary Clinton. I made there's no real hardcore political bias. I mean, I think, you know, Trump was a definite easy target and more fun to make fun of for sure. But I've, you know, done all sides of the political spectrum. So it's not, you know, I don't really feel like it was a big risk for me to do Trump, but it was a, yeah, definitely led to a whole bunch of videos getting taken down, unfortunately. <laughs> But most of the stuff, like the riskiest stuff I do with that could get canceled or taken down is there's like borderline nudity and weird, gross things that people might not like. So I kind of uh, get some of those things taken down once in a while, too. But as far as like actual cancel culture stuff, I don't feel any threat. I don't really push people's buttons in that way. I'm not that's I'm not trying to provoke in that way. I'm mostly trying to entertain. So I don't feel like it's a risk. And um, is um, YouTube, your YouTube account still like a big source of income through AdSense or? Um... No, it was never, uh, it was never income for me. I, cause I was doing a lot of remix materials. I did a big uh, project called the chickening where I took the Stanley Kubrick's uh, the shining and we turned it into this, uh, you know, the, the overlook hotel in that film, we turned it into a, a chicken themed restaurant resort that uh, Jack Nicholson was going to. It was kind of like a film project that I did as a pitch uh, for a new TV show where we could take all these old films and turn them into something new by adding visual effects. So it was this like sort of pitch piece, but it, it gained a kind of a weird uh, traction in the film festival circuit. And all of a sudden this film got into Sundance and Toronto International Film Festival and over a hundred other film festivals took this little thing called the chicken inks and ran with it. So I kind of have always been doing this remixy stuff where I'm using other people's content to make something new and it's totally, you know, fair use parody stuff, but I don't really believe in monetizing that stuff. And also they would like Warner brothers could have taken it down because they own the frames of that film, you know? So I've always just saw YouTube as a promotional tool for me to put my artwork up and, you know, from there get jobs where I'd get paid by people to actually do things. So I never made any money off of Instagram or uh, YouTube or anything, to tell you the truth. So, and um, what is the ratio nowadays that you do this professionally? How much of your time you spend on doing like paid projects for whatever kind of client there is or in how much time can you spend on I don't know, doing the videos that you do yourself for fun and just for the pleasure of the art? Well, for the last bunch of years, it was pretty hardcore, like all the time doing pro like I'm, I was booked three months out always. So I was just like, I'd have to like make time for myself to do a piece, uh, you know, just for the hell of it. So been a very busy bunch of years, but then the kind the like, digital art NFT boom kind of happened a year or two ago, which has since died completely. But when that happened, I was able to kind of start selling these artworks that I would normally do messing around on Instagram anyway. So I kind of dove full tilt and stopped taking jobs for a little while just to like focus on that, which is, you know, very lucrative and cool. But I've, I kind of view NFTs as a real double edged sword. The, you know, I, I love it for art and I really feel like in the next, you know, decades or centuries we're going to need ways to sell digital art i don't think we're you know i think that there's so much cool stuff happening in the ai art world world realm and, and in video installations and cool projection mapping and all this stuff like i think that that is really on the forefront of, of modern art and i think that there needs to be a way to sell it and if whether blockchain is the solution or other some other kind of way to be able to sell this i don't think that's going away but the collectible stuff, like I never really got into that, man. Like I, I, I was, you know, I'm not into Pokemon cards and I'm not into 
uh, you know, hockey cards and, and beanie babies either, but I just don't really, I like, I didn't drink the Kool-Aid on, on the board apes and stuff like that to tell you the truth. And it got really kind of out of hand. Like, I really think that the, the quarter million dollar ape JPEG is a bit ridiculous and it needed to come back down to earth. And I mean, I, I, I thought it was great that I was able to sell some art and people wanted to collect it. And that's, you know, it's still ongoing. Like I still, will make pieces that take me a month or more. And if somebody wants to buy it, awesome. But I think that, you know, that initial euphoria and insanity of the NFT market uh, needed to kind of come back down to earth a little bit, which it has. So we'll see if a, a proper, more normalized market comes out of it. I kind I think it can turn into something more reasonable with like almost like the music industry where you have different labels, like that's kind of support artists and help, sell their work or who knows where it's going to go. But that kind of took over for the last couple of years for me. But then also all my clients from before that wanted to do these NFT projects. So I ended up starting to do NFT projects for my clients. So it ended up being coming full circle where it was both, you know, NFT work and client work at the same time, which was sometimes cool. <laughs> but how do you do like NFT work for your clients? Like what kind of, uh, people or organization because like nft a collectible it's something that um in my opinion it has to be very like um it's like art like if it's nft art and then it's connected to the artist so if you do it like it's if i ask you to do an nft for for um, i don't know for our podcast for instance like i would still need to say okay this is an nft by TCI made by this artist that was like I would be the sort of the gallery or not the person because like in my opinion the art is very connected yeah. to well, like it's it's like if yeah, I had yeah. asked Picasso back in the days can you draw me a painting and I'll sell it <laughs> so it's like it doesn't yeah make sense. well the one it's uh, because I mean NFTs can have a ton of uses. So I mean the one that I did with uh, Dead Mouse, Dead Mouse and I have made like three music videos together, and I've done tons of his uh, live tour visuals and stuff like that. So he wanted to make a, a, a project using his mouse head, where he can make an NFT collection where the owners of them could get free stuff out of it, like you know concert tickets. So now if you're involved in the Discord on that project, you can get a, a ticket i actually went to a dead mouse show here in toronto and hung out with like 20 or 30 of the nft holders who were all like well we got free tickets and they were pumped you know and got to see the show so i i, I think that's cool where if you have used the nft for something like that where you can you know give something back to your fans and stuff like that so that was a cool project um i did one with uh uh, wu-tang clan as well because they had that album they made one copy of back in the day it was uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in Shaolin. So there was a, <laughs> a scheme to make that into an NFT because the buyer of that uh, album went to jail for securities fraud or something. He was like this guy they call the Pharma Bro. I don't know if you heard of him, Martin Scarelli. No. So he bought, the Wu -Tang, he, he bought that Wu-Tang album for a million bucks or something back in the day. And it was supposed to be an art piece. There's only one copy of this album and there was never any uh commercial rights attributed to it you can't release it commercially for uh 88 years or something like that so they wanted to take any you know doubt away that there was a, that this was a you know piece of art and not some stunt to release this album so they released this piece of art one album and then this guy who bought it went to jail because he was kind of he ran a pharmaceutical company and a hedge fund and he was using money from one to pay the other and whatever he went he so he went to jail for running a ponzi scheme then they wanted the Wu Tang Clan wanted to make a new, make it that album into an NFT so that they could sell the NFT, get the money, give it to the Department of Justice in the U.S. and and give and sell the album with the NFT. So they asked me to do the artwork for it. So I was like, okay, that sounds cool. So that was like a you know a client NFT project, but it was also like I could do mostly whatever I want, working with them, bouncing an idea off them, making the animation, but. The actual video hasn't even been released yet, so I'm just still waiting for that to drop one of these days. But that was another sort of client NFT project in the music space, you know? 
And you do only so, the visual stuff. You don't do the music because also when you go on your website, there are certain videos with music. So do you do? I do all the music, music for those too. Yeah. Yeah, because I, cause like I said, I started in the kind of video remix world where I was making music for all my videos. I still do that. I still make all the music for my videos whenever I can, and advertising too. So yeah, music is kind of complicated, work. isn't it? Because it's like sound mani manipulating sound to me has been always like um, very difficult to imagine. Maybe my brain works that way, but you have to know also some technical stuff in that case, don't you? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Like I find it the fun part, like after doing like if I do work on a video for like a month where I'm doing all this grueling animation and keyframing, then I'm like, oh, great. I got I'm going to set aside a few days at the end just to make the music for it. And that's kind of the fun part for me where it's like easy and I don't know, I just have fun scoring my own pieces after they're made. But a lot of the time it's it's in the process because all my animation is timed to a tempo. So I usually start out with a tempo track and make a beat that I edit to and animate to, and then, you know, jump back into the music periodically. So it's kind of a lot of the time gets done in tandem with the video project. So, cause you want those to have a really strong link or I do anyway, uh, you know, the, the visual and the audio are all intertwined. So. And uh, what is your, what was your approach to learn these softwares? Um, because you know uh, many softwares if you do video um, CGI uh, VFX um, music you probably need to record also you were used to record some stuff um, mm -hmm. like that's a lot of stuff to learn like in order to master and it's them expensive and to buy all this shit <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It adds up every year now as subscription services. It's out of control. But yeah, it's, I don't know. I just, uh, same as you, like little tons of tutorials online. Sometimes it's just trial and error if there isn't any tutorial for that specific thing you need to do. I am also on a lot of forums and, uh, you know, I, T uh, talking to experts online when I have a problem, everyone in, in the VFX motion graphics community is pretty helpful. So I have like, you know, especially for Houdini, cause I find Houdini very difficult and it was like, you know, a slow learning process for me compared to everything else. So I've kind of like tapped into some good forums online where I can reach out to experts who will help me out if I need. And yeah, I don't know. It's just kind of getting out there and meeting people and going to actual going to some of these motion graphics conferences like D2 and like, uh, you know, uh, ResFest in, in Chicago and NAB in in uh, Las Vegas and stuff. I, I've been able to kind of meet a ton of people in the field, too, who have different skills. So sometimes I actually hire those people. Sometimes I hit them up for knowledge. Like, it's just good to kind of get go to these conferences to just meet people and gain these resources, you know? In the, yeah, but what I'm asking is like, um, I'm approaching, I, for example, I started the podcast like now almost yeah, more than two years ago in 2020. And I had zero skills about um, audio or how to record it exactly. And just, I loved listening to podcasts and I, one of the podcasts I liked stop being produced so i was like okay then i'm gonna do my own podcast and and the let's do it and then i started from zero and then i learned a little bit uh, about how to record the sound then after a while I, I learned how to make it a little bit better then i bought a little bit better gear and then at some point i decided okay i want to make it video too because it seems like if it's not video it's not that popular and um and learning these different things needs certain, like, if you, and I also have a full-time job because I still have to pay the bills too. And uh, sure. learning one new skill, it requires, um, because you have these, I can imagine that you have m many ideas. Like I have many ideas, like I have ideas for graphic design. I have ideas for uh, video. I have ideas for videos that need a little bit of animation. But if you don't focus on on one thing, because when you're when you're newbie in a certain software, you need consistent work with that software in order for you to become very familiar with I don't know shortcuts and way of working sure. and finding your workflow. 
So I'm wondering, can you, did you stay consistent at, for, on one thing at, at a time? Or, yeah, how did you, because you need a certain momentum, in my opinion, in order to move on the next thing. So you need to learn, yeah, I don't yeah. know, Premiere Pro and yeah, then you I can think... work After Effects or vice versa, but whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I guess like, you know, for many, many years, it was just After Effects and Premiere and then Cinema 4D kind of started slowly jumping in. And then, you know, as when Octane came around too, and being able to render fast, I don't know, I just sort of gravitated more and more into these things. But nowadays, it's like when I need to learn something new, like Houdini was really cool for soft body stuff and particle simulations and water simulations, stuff like that. So I wanted to add that into my scenes. And then houdini was one of those things it's like yeah i used it once go back and then next time i went there i was like ah, i forgot everything you know and like yeah you have to just keep plowing at it keep trying and using it and finding reasons to use it over and over again to learn it so it really nothing nothing beats just putting in the hours like that's really what it comes down to every time so i think that like if i'm going to spend time on a software like zbrush zbrush is really awesome i use it all the time for adding details and textures and, and stuff to things, but I'm not a good sculptor. It's like to sculpt someone from scratch and get their likeness is a very difficult skill that takes thousands of hours to like, you know, learn. So I know that I'm not going to be that guy. I don't really desire to spend that time to learn ZBrush for that skill, but I, I need to know ZBrush for uh, topology correction for, you know, d d um, doing all kinds of like mesh fixing and like, and other sculpting reasons, you know, like, so it's very, you know, I knew I had to learn it. So I learned these very specific things that I do in ZBrush and that's what, like what I use it for, but I don't really have a desire to go much further into like becoming a sculptor. You know what I mean? So I think it's, it's about realizing what you need the software for and becoming good at and familiar at those those specific things and branching out from there, you know, because now that I have this base knowledge of ZBrush, I can jump in there if I need to do some sculpting and mess around and, and work on getting a little better at that stuff. But it's kind of, uh, yeah, I mostly I learn new software because I have a problem I need to solve and that software is going to solve that problem. So I need to learn how to do that. And that's how the knowledge grows. I never just go, oh, I'm going to like start using Substance Painter for fun and learn it you know it's like no i need to get a paint job on this car right now and it's like yeah it's out of necessity not you know for fun it's not recreation <laughs> but you still then when you need to do one little thing you learn that one little thing and you don't know the software like if, for instance if you like learn to do one thing in um one thing in in after effects you don't know after effects you just know how to do that one thing um, yeah. That's why I start with this, for example, more solid, base solid classes that are still very cheap, but they can teach you some overview of the software so that you have a little bit more of, you know, consciousness and <laughs> awareness of what you're doing when you're in the software. And then, I don't know, if you need to do specifically one thing, then you can watch a video and then... You say, ah, this is yeah. another thing that the software can do, and I can use these tools. Um, so, oh, yeah. well, it's about getting inspired, you know. Like once you learn one thing in a software, like and how it works, then you're it's in your mind now, and it's like, oh, I could do that in that software, and it's not this hurdle anymore. You know what I mean? Like but learning, having the first icebreakers of learning a software breaks down the the barriers and gets you uh, inspired to do more. You know, so. I find it's just if something does something cool and better, like cause Cinema 4D kind of does everything, but it's not the best at everything, you know, like Houdini mm -hmm. is better for some stuff, ZBrush is better for some stuff, even Blender is better for some stuff. So it's kind of like learning the limitations of software and how, you know, you can improve your workflow. It's just about, it's also about speed. Like if something's going to take twice as long in one piece of software than the other, like it's worth learning for the long term, you know. And you mentioned that um, those uh, softwares are very expensive and they're on a subscription base. Are there like some software that you use not so often so that you can really subscribe once in a while for one month or you need to have them all yeah, the time? Like all I, find, I find like even like Substance Painter and that Adobe extra package, you know, the, the Substance set, I don't use it every day. I, I have projects where I need to use the Substance Painter for like, a couple days and I don't need it. So I, I do that like month to month when I need it. 
certain plugins are the same way but like i mean i i'm full-time all year round adobe subscriber maxon subscriber octane i have like seven render nodes here for octane so i'm like full blast into that uh render world um houdini is fairly cheap actually compared to most like so you can get an indie license for a couple hundred bucks for a year so that one's actually quite reasonable compared to a lot of the other platforms but but yeah i mean i mostly pay for you know all of all the stuff i use constantly there's not Wait. too much stuff that i can even do that like it's almost not cost effective for a lot of software to do it mm -hmm. by the month but the the um, the um, what is it called the indies license in autodesk it's uh, houdini is autodesk right uh no houdini is side effects side effects so what is the indie indie license like what is the requirement in order to get the indie license at, at that i think it's about your uh income like if you're making um uh x amount of a hundred thousand dollars or more or something off of that software then you need to buy a uh, professional license or something like that but it's fully functional i believe the houdini indie license but do you need to provide them with your like i don't know tax return thing or no i think it's just you know a bit of an honor system but if you get caught you know using it on a massive project i'm sure that they might come after you who knows <laughs> i've never heard of that but i'm sure it's possible i see i see well um <laughs> Good to know. No, I didn't know about these indie licenses uh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. After I talked to one guy on the podcast here, he explained to me, and I was like, "Oh, really? There's such a thing that exists? I didn't know about yeah. it." Yeah. Well, um, same thing with like uh, Unreal Engine, right? Like Unreal is is free to use, but if you're making a certain amount of money, you have to uh, give a percentage, actually, I think, of your of your project to them. No, oh, it's great. Yeah. yeah, that's a smart <laughs> smart thing because some people do expensive stuff with that thing. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, in in terms of hardware, I mean, you mentioned there are a lot of money into software. Probably there are also a lot of money into hardware. Yeah, I've got a pretty psycho setup. Well, actually, the crazy thing was, uh, I did the last uh, Dead Mouse music video, and it, the budget wasn't great for it. So Joel actually gave me two of his crazy GPU servers at that time. So, cause I needed them to render the project. So then after it was done, I was like, Hey man, I'll bring these back to you. And he's like, yeah, whatever you can keep them. So <laughs> he like, let me have these two awesome GPU servers. So they had kind of older quadro cards in them, but they're still good, you know, but they're, you know, now the 30 eighties and whatnot are so much more uh, CUDA cores for octane rendering that they're way faster. So I've been going on uh, like local buy and sell sites and finding all these crypto miners who are selling their machines for nothing right now. Like I bought just last week, I bought seven 30, 70 TI blower cards on a big mining rig, uh, off this guy for $2,000, which like six months ago would have been 10,000 or more, you know, like it was crazy. So I've, I've been scooping up all this used, uh gpus and putting them in in my machine so now i have i think i have six or seven boxes here all networked with uh, 10 gigabit uh, uh network and uh it's pretty awesome for octane rendering especially because it can use all the cards and all the the entire network so i have a pretty serious render farm over here with 30 i think 29 gpus total and uh over six machines and i also do rendering over the render network octane otoy has a uh, kind of peer-to-peer -peer render service rndr render so i run all of my machines as nodes on that so i can make money rendering other people's projects here as well so it's kind of that's where most of my hardware goes is to keeping these machines up and running the nodes do you have also the skills of building the machines and putting them together or you have a person that yeah comes with it? yeah i had to i actually just drove to detroit uh two days ago because my friend had two uh x99 motherboards that could take four gpus each so he like sold them to me for 500 bucks with cpus in them so i i tell was like that's a deal and a half man so i <clears throat> drove the three hours and grabbed those off of him, brought them back and then started putting all these old mining GPUs in them. So my, if you could see my, the other side of my table now, it's just this heap of gear <laughs> that I've been putting together. But yeah, I just built two computers this week. 
do you use this stuff also to mine like um crypto or i really? did a little bit before but I, I didn't want to uh uh burn out my cards on crypto mining because i need them for rendering so i found mm -hmm. that like i did it here and there just you know especially in the winter if i could use the heat <laughs> But uh, but when when the render network went live and I, I got invited to participate in that, it's actually more money you can make rendering than you could make mining, and it uh, it only burns your it doesn't burn your machines as hot, and it's uh, periodic. Like it comes in, you know, a job will come in, then it'll sit idle for an hour, and then another job will come in. You know what I mean? So it's not running your machines hot twenty four seven. So it's uh, kind of better. Yeah, I understand. No, it's um, I can't imagine. But also, like t this adds another like skill that you have to learn. Like also, you have to learn about computers, or you knew already a little bit uh, because I don't know you started really young, or or you yeah, had to I was kind of messing around, messing around for many years building computers. So because messing around with these things is expensive, you know. <laughs> like, <laughs> I always well, it was more out of necessity. It's like, uh, you know, having for early on having my dad's old computers and then something would break on it and having to figure it out because, you know, you can't afford to get a new one. So you have to try and fix it. <laughs> I, I remember doing that also when I was uh, younger and a teenager. And at some point I got lazy and I was like, I'm going to go with the yeah. standard stuff because it's just... Uh, you know, like you have to also check always the compatibility of the different pieces. Oh. Yeah. And um, but that's mostly most of that. I will steal that information online from someone who has built a successful machine or I go I call uh, computer companies to get quotes on uh, building me a machine and then they give you a parts list and the price and then you just buy all the parts and build it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I did that too. <laughs> <laughs> and they're really nice because they tell you like oh you, because what you would do is like you would go to those companies and they ask you what do you want but you don't know what you want so you go back yeah, yeah. you look online what someone else has <laughs> then you go back to them with your list and they tell you oh why did you pick this there is this other piece who, which actually works really much better and then they yeah. change that thing and then they give you all the list and they tell you well are you gonna buy them think about it <laughs> yeah that's the way that's the way to do it man but no. uh yeah i mean don't obviously it sucks to uh waste somebody's time with something like that but it's there's bigger companies that list all their parts online too like the the companies that make big uh, systems for you know larger companies and stuff so the information's online if you want a parts list but yeah yeah no do you have like some websites that you suggest for those stuff um, well, the, I actually bought a machine at the height of the pandemic because I needed a new machine. So I bought one off of Box in the U.S. because I needed new video, new 3090 cards. You just couldn't buy them anywhere. So I actually had to buy a machine off of them just to get the 3090s. But by looking at their specs on their machines and their their lists, they they do ex excessive testing of all these. Uh, G certain GPU models with certain motherboards and everything like that. So they really know their stuff. So I kind of like look at their builds and uh, as a benchmark. How was it during the um, during the pandemic when um, there was this, I mean, there is still the chip problem. Like, did you have some issues finding stuff? So that's why you need to get um, used. That At that time, yeah, I was, uh, like I said, I bought that machine, but... Um, I kind of like, other than my main machine, I still keep all my old machines as render nodes. So I have a ton of extra, you know, render power and, and hardware. If anything goes wrong, I can jump on another machine. And I have a big NAS server, central server with all of my assets and everything on it. So I'm kind of good if there's any emergency. But I didn't find, other than just that one machine I had to buy, I didn't really have any problems with the pandemic as far as sourcing anything goes. Cool. And I'm curious, like when every time I speak to people like you that have so many skills and uh, also like you got some sort of vir virality with your work and you get projects, um, how does that affect your personal life? Do you uh, have to sacrifice a lot of that because you're always like kind of pushed on working on these projects or you still like 
because it started like uh, as a hobby now you have more time actually how how is that situation yeah, i don't know but, i this is kind of all i do now is sit at this computer and like make stuff for the most part i mean i i have other hobbies and whatnot else but i purpose like by design too like i mean i don't have children and my wife is super also like hardcore into her work so we have kind of a, a nice life where we can both focus on our careers and have fun in the meantime and not have to go to soccer practice so <laughs> like this is a life we chose and we enjoy it you know so i think if i was trying to balance having a family and all this stuff i it would be more of a problem but i've kind of set up my life that i can have fun and spend as much time making my art as i want so i kind of like you know i don't really have too much uh time constraints problem most of the problem is like when i start getting jobs piling up and i've got like three four months of projects that i have to do and i have no time for my own art that's when i get like antsy because like if i feel like i'm a slave to all my projects for other people and i don't have time for my own stuff that's when i'm like Ugh. you know carve out some personal time to do a project or whatever you know so that that happens every once in a while when i get overrun with with jobs what But is that's... what is the the thing that satisfies you most in your work is it like the f end product is it the i don't know uh rewards that you get from like the not the rewards but the recognition that you get by clients and people who will watch to your staff or is it the money what is for you personally um the biggest reward out of your work because you know for guess... for everything there is like a price like you know you have to the price is to spend all this time into your craft and then the result is what you make so what is for you the biggest reward out of this uh yeah i just i like being able to see the reaction online once i post something because especially lately i've been spending like over a month on a piece you know like just tons of detail and then you know pouring my heart into something so it's always awesome to see when it's well received you know like and even even talking at these uh conferences like going to d2 and having people come up to me saying they were super inspired by my work and stuff like that i, I love hearing that feedback you know like meeting people who get a kick out of the artwork and, you know, reading comments where people are like, you know, making jokes and, and, and love the, the, the work. So I guess it's kind of for the, the interaction with fans and, and, you know, getting good feedback from stuff. And even sometimes bad feedback is hilarious too. So it's kind of like it, that interaction, I guess, of throwing your artwork out there and having people react to it is, is kind of what I'm in it for. It's, it's to entertain people and make a, you know, cool stuff. And learning, like, I mean, half of it for me too is I'm I'm passionate about learning these new skills. I want to get better. I want to like make crazier and crazier things that are harder and harder to make. And I don't know, eventually, I don't know where what the end game is, but I mean, it's just, I kind of enjoy challenging myself and learning new stuff. So that's the other half of it for me. Money is kind of like, you know, I try and make enough money that I can buy all my cool computer stuff and get by, but I'm not, you know, buying sports cars or have my eyes on any ridiculous things that I can't afford. So it's kind of, for me, if I have enough money in the bank and I did a ton of projects that year, I'll carve out time to do my personal work because it's, that, that's not my driving force is the, the money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you, like you say, if you wanted to make this thing bigger on the money side, you could like, I don't know, take more projects, hire people, turn it into a company, but then you don't do it. I've always avoided that. I've always yeah. avoided making this into a company because like, I don't know, I kind of hated having employees when I was doing construction and I don't really, I, I meet so many people who used to love making videos and animation and rolling up their sleeves and doing it and learning software. And now all they do is run five employees and, and go around being a sales guy to try and get enough work to keep those mouths fed, you know? And I don't want to do that. I don't want to just answer emails and sell, you know, this project to people so that I, you know, and I also like sometimes like there were years where I needed rotoscoping done all the time. I was doing three, four days a week of just rotoscoping for my projects. And it's like, should I hire a rotoscoper? And it's like, well, next year I don't even have those projects. I don't need that rotoscoper. So there's so many people is, out there that what you is can, rotoscoping. I don't know. Oh, sorry. Cutting out video frame by frame. Oh, okay. You know? Yeah, like really monotonous kind of work. But, you know, there's people online that do that for a living. You can hire them to do it when you need it. So I, I, I hire people all the time for projects. And it's hard sometimes because the good people are always busy. But 
having employees 24 seven. And also I get into the zone here where I don't even talk to people for like a whole day and I get tons done. And I, I feel like by not having any, any employees where I have to talk about anything, I get as much done as people do in three days in one day. You know what I mean? Cause I don't, <laughs> don't have any distractions. So How is your, know. your sleep and the awake ratio? Do you sleep like very few hours um, or do you manage to sleep like enough? I'm about six hours, six hours a night, usually something like that. And, and do you practice <laughs> also some sports or not really? Uh, I bike around a lot. I got, I have a little, uh, small boat on Toronto Island that I bike to a few times a week. So I go, you know, do some pretty far bike rides and that's my exercise for the most part. But yeah, I'm not really, uh, I'm not on any organized sports teams or anything like that. <laughs> no, I was just asking me, some people run, some people go to the gym. Um, yeah, yeah. so I, I don't know because all this computer working also, I guess you work at home, so you don't really need to go anywhere. Um, yeah, well, I lived, I lived down the street. This is just my workspace here. I've got, oh, uh, okay. You have an extra work. My, my servers are so loud. I probably couldn't sleep here. <laughs> ah, yeah, because, um, yeah, I was thinking about that, that the server must be like doing all the fans stuff like, yeah, yeah, it's a bit loud. And um, you are like very, very, uh, how do you say, I, I don't want to say famous, but like, yeah, let's say it famous within the internet space and uh, a lot of people are connected with you. Do, does those people ask you often for collaborations or do they connect with you? Because I saw like, I don't know, probably you, you know, people and people like this, or at least they also follow you on Instagram or other social media. I don't know. So yeah. is that something um, uh, very common to get like a lot of, um, um, a lot of connections with, with, with those people to work together or yeah yeah i did a project with uh people and madonna last year who was also an nft project and uh i i helped people out on his uh one of his physical pieces i said i don't i don't think he's announced it yet but it's a couple months ago i helped him with a project he did one um called human one a while ago it's like a kind of a cube or a rectangle with like four video screens on it that rotates around and then it's like there's animation that looks like it's inside of the box because it's all timed with the motor of the of the piece. So he was doing more of those, and I helped out with some animation on that. That's coming out soon, I think. I uh, I haven't heard when it's releasing, but yeah. So there's all these collabos come from, you know, Instagram messages. I'm working on one right now with uh, Tommy Lee from Motley Crew. I'm doing animation with him because I met him in the summer at a at a party and uh he was uh, he started sharing my work so i hit him up on instagram and i was like hey man thanks for po you know posting my work if you ever want to do a collab let me know and he's like yeah man i'm so fucking down so he <laughs> i started pitching something to him and then now we're doing it so yeah sometime next month i hope i'll be done be a, it's and, a funny animation um who did you say was that because i don't know uh, Tom, tommy lee he's you know the band motley crew uh no not really i don't okay. know if i well, should know that a, <laughs> oh yeah it's a big, uh, big rock and roll band from uh back in the day in america uh yeah, yeah i know i like, like i saw the picture now because sometimes i'm really bad with names like uh, famous actors and stuff like that i don't remember uh yeah. i don't remember the names because i don't know they're not so familiar to me <laughs> don't call them but uh, unless you're not like someone yeah, I, I don't knows. i don't know any, yeah yeah sure and i don't know many uh, bulgarian celebrities either <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, i have to know the celebrities of italy bulgaria yeah Germany, exactly so i uh i, I have to pick just the top <laughs> or yeah, just yeah. the one that uh, somehow uh, interests me um <laughs> No, man, really cool talking to you. Like, really, it's always nice and refreshing to to hear people that are so, um, I don't like to say successful, but more rather like um, accomplished. Because you seem to me when I talk to you that you're really, really 
happy with with where you are with where with what you have achieved with where you're heading to and uh, as you said you don't have like a real goal it sounds to me like there is this concept i i read in one book of um i don't remember what the guy is called something simon simon sinek i think it's called um, the infinite war concept so that for example like in the vietnam war the americans lost because the the Vietnam, the Viet Congs had like they they were fighting as long as it takes. They didn't have like an end goal, yeah. and like this could be a very successful approach to stuff that you really love. Like you love what you do, and you don't have like you're not hurrying or anxious to get to somewhere. You're just going with yeah. the flow and doing your thing, and it's so so um, so cool to to see that people yeah, are. Thanks managing to do that and stay like very down to earth you were very like also friendly when i approached you and directly <laughs> accepted the invitation some people like uh, when they see that i'm not the biggest podcast on earth they say yeah i don't know oh, maybe. No. Um, <laughs> which is okay yeah, like, which is okay i'm i'm okay with that like the the the, the thing that i really hate is when people tell me i'm gonna do it and they never like they never do it they never reply again oh, no. well i almost i almost forgot <laughs> no but i was like um in your case it was okay because a few days ago you contacted me and said like uh what is this thing what that we're this? doing <laughs> <laughs> and I no, but honestly, I, my calendar my calendar this month was like so many things and i'm just like i was like what the what the fuck was that one man like i just had too many things in my calendar i totally slipped up but it was also we booked this like what a couple months ago yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know, like everybody's <laughs> different. Some people are like, um, the, also like some people, I invite them and they book the next day, and I'm like, God damn, like I didn't expect oh, no. that. Um, <laughs> but also some people book like three months in uh, in advance, and um, because yeah. everybody that comes here to the podcast, the people that are listening don't know they can decide when to do the podcast. Uh, because yeah, yeah. <laughs> otherwise I would go crazy texting with everyone when exactly to do it. <laughs> um, but no, I'm like, it's like there is this common thing that people are like really um, passionate about their craft and they don't do it like for for the money or for the glory. And also like this being passionate makes you get better and better. Um, and yeah, I, sure. I hope like listening to your journey it's always interesting for other people that might think oh i cannot do it because there is this and this and this reason mm, you yeah. should just take small steps and you never know when you're gonna where you're gonna end yeah, up. and still to this day like i always tell people um you know that i can trace every job i've ever got back to some project that i did for myself for fun you know what i mean like so that doing that that film remix of the shining the chickening thing that got me uh, advertising jobs with kentucky fried chicken the big you know conglomerate in the states and then that uh that video i made for fun of the view led to that video or led to that job at conan you know like uh messing around on doing remix stuff led to you know that uh web series that i did for mono media like it's just it's just every single project or everyone hears about me because of something i did on instagram now like it's all just stuff i did for fun so every time i feel bogged down or like that i'm not in control of my schedule like because i just you know things come into my inbox or whatever and i'm like all right i'll do this project and then i'm you know sometimes i feel like i'm not in control of my own destiny right it's just like these things come in and I go do this and that. And then every once in a while, I just feel like I need to take that control back and stop and like, just make something for me for fun. And that always leads to more jobs or more opportunities, you know? So it's kind of like having that reset and, you know, going back to make sure that you're doing stuff for yourself, not for other people is important, I think. Or it's the only thing that worked for me because I can never tell someone to follow my path and go to art school, drop out, do construction for 10 years, start a stupid uh, website called Smear Balls and fucking, you know, hope people pay you to do your work. Like, that's just, that's a recipe for failure, you know? Like, that's not going to give you any success whatsoever. But the thing that was successful for me was just to keep learning new things and keep putting work out that made me laugh or made me, you know, entertain and uh, work came from that yeah no totally and like one thing that stops people from doing um 
from achieving great things or achieving what they want is that a lot of people look for like the quick result. They think that you one day decided that you're going to do one video and then you posted it and it got viral and then you got all the stuff. It didn't work that way. It doesn't work that way any in any case. Like you have to start. The yeah. first one is just shitty. Then you put it out there. And then you think, mm, this I don't like. And then you get better here and there. And then but you can also... You can only ride a wave of success for so long without having to do more work. Like, you know, I remember feeling top of the world when that that DC shoes thing became an official spot. I was like, oh, my God, like because I was working construction still. And I'm like, ah, now I can do video. And it's like, you know, a bunch of months goes by and you didn't get any video projects. It's not like you all of a sudden made it. So then you have to go, you know drywall a basement or something like it's still it's not like there's this binary thing where you just make it even after after conan or after you know any of these big projects i did that was like a big leap or or even a music video for dead mouse or something like that there's a lull afterwards that you're like oh sometimes you know and sometimes you just get project after project but then you know even now sometimes i'm like uh oh, what happens if i you know, don't get an opportunity for six months. What am I going to do? I need to think of something to do. Like there's not, you can't always be at this peak pinnacle of your career. There's ups and downs. It always fluctuates, you know, it's never this like blast of nonstop success for anyone. I don't think, you know? Yeah. I think every time you bounce down, like you go down, you bounce a little bit higher than the last peak. That's the, yeah, you, you, hope you know, so, you anyway. go like uh, exponentially upper, but you have to yeah. stand there and like suck it up when it sucks. Like, um, oh yeah. For, for me personally, I'm, I haven't like, um, I don't know. I don't feel that I have done something uh, out, out like extraordinary. But like, just keep showing up and doing these podcasts with different people. The, the best thing that I can get is at least getting to know all these people. And it was so weird because I went to the states like this month was the first time in my life and it was so weird because I knew so many people there but I've never been oh, there wow. before and then when we when we met because there is this long form conversation where you talk to people like like you would talk with anyone you feel like connected like uh, now probably I know more things about you than many of the people who have followed you for longer time and then just show seeing your videos you know like um, sure yeah so it's actually really it's kind of funny sometimes how people get the complete wrong idea about me because of my videos. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I went to, I went to Japan one time to to judge a, a VR uh, competition, and uh, these guys in Japan were all kind of like whispering. And I was like, "What are you guys talking about?" They're like, "Oh, we thought you you were going to be this crazy person because of your videos, you know." And I'm like, "Oh, really? Like what? You thought I was going to come in here and start throwing tables around or something? <laughs> like what did you expect?" <laughs> but I don't know what people expect. I mean, so I make some pretty strange videos, so if people think that's a reflection of who I am, I guess as a person, they might expect some pretty weird things. But uh, these guys in Japan at least were pleasantly surprised that I wasn't a, a raging lunatic. So <laughs> <laughs> no, for example, for me, it was really funny because I discovered also like Beeple through the um, D2 conference because in 2017, he was there and I saw the video online. And to me, it was so funny that he looks like Bill Gates, but like, <laughs> like curse every second word that I was, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking that kind of contrast is really, uh, really funny. <laughs> like maybe you should do some, I don't know if you have already done maybe some videos with uh, Bill Gates and I don't know. Oh, there, yeah. are, <laughs> there are a lot of topics out there. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> so, or like uh, now, uh, I don't know, Elon Musk, the last two days is really trying to be hated <laughs> hardly. <laughs> like all the... Yeah, he's quite the guy. All the like bonus points that he has always had, he's like <laughs> destroy his bread. <laughs> yeah, well, he can kind of do whatever he wants with the amount of money he has, I guess. Yeah, uh, I think, but I think no matter how much money you have, at some point you have to realize that you shouldn't be um, giving your loud opinion about every single topic that is out there because it's like, oh yeah, it's, especially even, when you haven't done your homework. <laughs> and especially when 
it's you're not an expert in the field like you can be as smart as you want but you're not an expert in everything so you 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 don't know everything so i think sure. it's this um well man like it's almost uh, an hour and a half i don't want to take away more time of your day because as we know you have a very busy schedule um <laughs> but we end up always the conversation on a positive note and i wanted to ask you if you can share with the audience uh, some things that uh pumps you up uh, creatively whether if it, you have some favorite book some favorite movie some favorite youtube channel some favorite podcast or activity like i don't know whatever sport traveling that um recharges your creative um, battery so to say oh yeah i don't know if it's like media so much that recharges me or inspires me i guess uh that's a hard one to say I don't know. I honestly just get most inspiration out of just doing this stuff every day. I can't say that there's like some other thing that brings me back to it. It's kind of everything else other than sitting here and making videos is like an escape from that. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I think that's important too. Like, like I said, my little escape is going to my, my little boat on Toronto Island and just, you know, looking at nature, looking further than two feet away for like a, a while. So I just recommend that you get some, you know, hobby that uh, gets you away from the computers if you're horribly addicted to them as I am. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. Get outside. That's outside. also that's also a thing. Well, Nick, thank you very much for being on the Creative Insider podcast. Um, I always say that it's your first time, but it doesn't have to be the last time. So whenever you want to come back and we can then focus on a certain new project that you're releasing or something that you want to share about, all my guests are always welcome back to, to come for a second round, a third round or whatever you would like to do. Thank you very much for your time. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. All right. Talk to you later, man.